Amen. Well, good morning and welcome home. It's good to see all of you today. If you're new with us today, my name's Adam. I'm the discipleship pastor here at Pitnaz. And uh, wasn't it good to see some of these strangers' faces up here today? We've, we've kind of swapped worship teams with Columbus for this morning, I, just for the fun of it, I guess. And I'm glad. I'm glad to see some of these, uh, some of these faces up here. But uh, last week, Kyle started a new series for us called It's Complicated, What Relationship Isn't. And uh, one of the things that, that Kyle talked about is complicated isn't necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes we use that as a, like it's a bad word, but complicated doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean bad. It just means there's lots of interconnecting parts, right, or many layers to life and to relationships. And so that's not a good thing or a bad thing. It just is. And uh, li- when, with that in mind, life is always going to be complicated, isn't it? I mean, we can simplify things to a degree, But life and relationships are always going to be complicated because there are always going to be many layers and there are always going to be many interconnected parts. And so the the principle that's sort of the, the umbrella over this whole series is this, following God is more about navigating the complicated faithfully rather than avoiding the complicated fearfully. Can we read that together? Following God is more about navigating the complicated faithfully rather than avoiding the complicated fearfully. And so last week, Kyle talked about how even our relationship with God can be complicated sometimes, especially when we can't, especially when we can't see what God is doing or why he's doing it. But I love the illustration that Kyle used. I think he only used this in, in one of the services last week, but uh, he talked about how when, when he was a teenager, there were times where his dad would get in one vehicle and tell him to get in another vehicle and say, okay, I want you to follow me. No matter where I go, just follow me. And there were times where, where Kyle would wonder, why is he turning here? Why is he going this way? But he always followed and so that's the same thing with our relationship with God. Sometimes we don't know, why, God, why are you doing this? God, why are you allowing that? God, why are you taking my life down this road? And it's okay to ask those questions, but we've still got to follow. We've still got to follow. And so today, like Kyle said earlier, um, today we're talking about our relationship with ourselves and how that can sometimes be complicated. How we see ourselves can be complicated. When I was in high school, there was a girl that um, well, well, I was interested in, and, uh, and so one day, well, let me back up. It wasn't really, it was never my style to just walk up to a girl that I didn't know and start talking to her. Like, that was never my style. Like, any girl that I ever dated, I always had some kind of relationship with or friendship with beforehand. But, but this girl, I, I decided to, you know, step out of my comfort zone a little bit. And so one day between classes, I, I just walked up to her, just cold, and, and introduced myself. You know, my, my self-image, you know, is probably right about here, you know, pretty high, confident in myself, walking up, introducing myself. And, and she said to me, she said, yeah, I know who you are. Okay, now understand, I, had a, I was in a big high school. There were like 1,400 kids in my high school. And so you didn't just know everybody especially if somebody was in a different grade than you, which she was. And so when she said, yeah, I know who you are, I'm thinking, yeah, yeah. And then she said, yeah, I hear your mom's really cool. I think what you just said to me is, my mom is more popular in my high school than I am. I think that's what you just said to me, girl. And so in a span of like 30 seconds, my self-image or my self-identity just went on a roller coaster ride. That's what happens sometimes to our identity. How we see ourselves, it can be complicated. And just in a short amount of time, it can do this because there are so many things that can complicate that. Things like pride. Pride can give us an inflated self-identity, or things like failure, which can give us a self-identity that's down here. Sin, especially when it's not confessed and we don't repent of it and shame starts to set in. In fact, we see that in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve bring sin into the whole world. It doesn't just affect their relationship with God and each other. If you read that story, it also affects how they see themselves. Fear can complicate our self-identity. Self-pity 
can complicate those things. But here's, here's the common denominator that all of those things have in common. All of them lead us to believe what others say about us more than what God says. Or they lead you to believe what you say about yourself more than what God says. And that's really what a, what a twisted, messed up identity comes down to. It comes down to believing what you or others say about you more than what God says. And so an example of that that we're going to look at this morning is a man named Elijah. If you want to find 1 Kings 19 in the Old Testament, either in your Bible or your Bible app, um, Elijah was a prophet of God. And uh, just to give you a little bit of background, in chapter 18, Elijah has this showdown with all of like 450 false prophets. And these prophets, they set up their, um, they, they set up their, uh, th- this altar, this sacrifice, and they start praying to their God to call down fire on this sacrifice. And they're doing all kinds of weird things, and nothing is happening because their God isn't real. And Elijah, he's just talking trash. Man, he's talking smack. At one point, you can read this yourself. At one point, he even says, maybe your God's off using the bathroom or something. Like, he's really getting into it. And then it's his turn, and he sets up a sacrifice, and he prays to God, and <laughs> fire comes down, consumes the whole sacrifice and the altar and everything on it. And so Elijah has this incredible, dramatic victory over these false prophets. He kind of makes you wonder if maybe some, some of that pride we mentioned earlier didn't start to set in a little bit. Then as we move into chapter 19, there's, a, there's an evil queen. Her name is Jezebel, and she finds out about this. She sends a message to Elijah, and she says, boy, I'm going to hunt you down, and I'm going to kill you. That's a loose translation, but that's basically what she says. Boy, I'm going to hunt you down, and I'm going to kill you. And then it gives us two important details that are going to drastically complicate Elijah's view of himself. In verse 3, it tells us Elijah was what? Afraid. Afraid, And he fled for his life. And he went on how? Alone into the wilderness. He was afraid and he was alone. Now, there are times when being alone is a good thing. And there are times when being alone is not a good thing. Because Satan, in, in times of pride or times of failure or times of fear... Satan loves to get us alone so that he can tell us things about ourselves that aren't true. And so being afraid is not a good time to be alone. In fact, even kids know this, right? A kid has a nightmare in the middle of the night, and they wake up and they're afraid. What do they do? They come get in bed with mom and dad, and then you spend the rest of your night with a knee in your back or an arm across your face. True story. (laughs) Might have happened to Jason last night. Even kids know that when you're afraid, that is not a good time to be alone. And that's exactly what Elijah does. Elijah allows fear to set in, and then he makes it worse by isolating himself. And that starts to complicate how he views himself. He sits down under a tree and he says this, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Did you catch the self-identity statement there? I am no better than my ancestors. You see, in this case, in this story, fear plus isolation leads Elijah to depression and self-pity, as we're about to say, as we're about to see. Fear plus isolation, in this case, leads to depression and self-pity. Or to put that another way, fear plus isolation is going to lead Elijah to an identity crisis. So Elijah gets some sleep, an angel comes and provides food and water for him, and then he travels for 40 days to Mount Sinai. That's the mountain where God had given Moses the Ten Commandments. And Elijah finds a cave, that's further isolation. He finds a cave to spend the night there, and at some point, God comes to him and says, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? In other words, this isn't you, Elijah, hiding out in a cave all by yourself 
in fear and self-pity. This isn't you. This isn't who you are. This is not who you are, Elijah. What are you doing here? Elijah doesn't really answer. He just says that the people of Israel have killed all the other prophets, and he says, I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. That's another self-identity statement. I'm the only one left, God. It's only me. In fact, there's a little bit of pride in that statement, isn't there? There's pride plus self-pity in that statement. I'm the only one left, God, in the whole land. I'm the only one left who's following you. I'm the only one left who's doing what's right. And now they're trying to kill me too. That's a pretty complicated self-image, isn't it? You got pride going on, and you got self pity going on, and you got fear going on. So, what's God going to do about this? Well, God tells him to go stand out on the mountain. In verses 11 and 12, we find these words It says, A mighty windstorm hit the mountain, but the Lord wasn't in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. And in that whisper, God tells Elijah some things. Remember the part of his messed up identity that is, was that he was all alone, the only one following God, the only one doing what was right. Well, look at one of the things that God tells him in that whisper. I will preserve, not raise up, not create, not bring about, into, not bring into existence something that isn't already there. He says, no, I will preserve, as in they're already there, I will preserve 7,000 people in all of Israel who have never bowed down to Baal, that's the name of the false god, or kissed him. 7,000 people. In other words, God says, stop feeling sorry for yourself, Elijah. You are not alone. You are not alone. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. In fact, who told you that about yourself, Elijah? Who told you that? Parents, next time your kid comes home from school talking about how dumb they are, or so-and-so said, I'm dumb, Some, so-and-so said this, or so-and-so said that, ask them, who told you that? Who told you that? Because I didn't tell you that. I, your dad, didn't tell you that. I, your mom, didn't tell you that. Who told you that? You going to listen to me? Your dad, your mom, who, has your, who loves you and has your best interests at heart, or are you going to listen to somebody who just wants to run you down to make themselves feel better? Who told you that? Good. Or maybe the next time you find yourself thinking thoughts like that about yourself, you need to ask yourself, who told you that? Who told you that? Who told you that you can't be a Christian because you've sinned too much? God's not in that voice. Just like God was not in that loud wind and fire and earthquake, God's not in that voice that tells you you've sinned too much to be a Christian. Who told you that? Who told you that you're worthless or you're an accident or you're a mistake God's not in that voice. Who told you that you have too much baggage to do anything for the kingdom of God? God's not in that voice. Who told you that you're just all alone in this world and and nobody, nobody possibly knows what you're going through? God's not in that voice. Who told you that you're just an addict? You could never beat this addiction. You could never beat this habit. That's just who you are. You're just an addict. God's not in that voice. Who told you that? 
Who told you that? Or to apply this maybe in some different ways, let's go to the other end of the spectrum. Who told you that you're better than everybody else because you've done this or you've never done that? God's not in that voice either. Who told you the world revolves around you so you can demand your way all the time? God's not in that voice. Who told you you can look down your nose at this person because your sins aren't as bad as theirs? God's not in that voice. God is not in that voice. Whatever you believe about yourself, ask yourself, who told you that? And after you answer that question, make sure you are listening to the right voice. Make sure you're listening to the right voice. There's a game that I've played with kids and teens before where uh, where you put a, a, you know, you have a volunteer on the other side of the room and you blindfold them and you say, okay, I'm going to give you directions to get from where you are to where I am. And usually they're like, oh, well, that sounds easy. And then you say, well, no, here's the trick. Um, I'm going to, everybody else in the room is going to be giving you other directions that aren't true. And so you've got to tune those voices out and you've got to listen to my voice. And it's a great way to teach the lesson that the world is full of voices, and those voices are often very loud, just like the fire and the wind and the earthquake on that mountain. And we've got to tune those things out and listen to the gentle whisper of God. Make sure you're listening to the gentle whisper. Because the gentle whisperer tells you things like, I created your inmost being, I knit you together in your mother's womb. In other words, God says, I created you. He says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. In other words, God says, you are no accident. I created you on purpose. The whisperer says, every moment of your life was laid out before a single day had passed. God says, I have a plan for your life. He says, I love you so much, I sent my son to die for you while you were still lost in sin. He says, nothing in else, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate you from my love. That's what the whisperer says about you. And he says, if you belong to me, you are a new person. The old life is gone. The new has come. God says, whatever is broken in you, because none of us are perfect, right? Whatever's broken in you, God says, I can transform, I can fix, I can make you new. That's the truth that the whisperer says about you. In other words, he says that you are uniquely created by me, you are deeply loved by me, and anything broken in you, I can transform. Form. That's what the God of all creation says about you. And anything that tells you anything other than that is straight from the pit of hell, straight from the mouth of Satan. And you've got to ask yourself, who am I going to listen to? Who am I going to listen to? When my dad was a senior in high school, he, uh, he flunked a class that he needed to graduate, and he had to take a summer, a summer class in order to officially graduate. And when he sat down with the guidance counselor to register for the class, uh, the man looked at him and said, Parrish, you'll never amount to anything. The guidance counselor said this to my dad. You'll never amount to anything. And I asked my dad once what that was like, and uh, he said, well, it didn't, it didn't scar me for life or anything. He said, I distinctly remember not believing him. And before I could ask my dad why he didn't believe this counselor, my dad answered the question for me. And he said, the reason that I didn't believe him is because a few months before that, my dad and I were sitting at the breakfast table talking about my future and he said, my dad, that's my grandpa, my dad said to me, son, I don't care if you're a garbage man or if you're the president of the United States, 
If you find a job that you enjoy and you can make a living at, I'm in your corner. Now, there's, uh, there's an obvious lesson in there, I hope an obvious lesson in there, about parenting. Parents, there are all kinds of voices who are going to tell your kids things about themselves. And whether or not they believe those things, is, it might very well hinge on the things that you have spoken into their life. But even if you're not a parent, there's a lesson in that story as well, isn't there? That lesson is, whose voice are you going to listen to? Whose voice are you going to listen to? My dad made the choice to listen to his father's voice and not this other person's. To listen to his father's voice and not somebody else's. Are you tracking with me? To listen to his father's voice. Listen to your father's voice. To your heavenly father's voice. Not to the voice of what somebody else is telling you. And not to the voice of what you're telling yourself. So whatever you believe about yourself today, Who told you that? And whose voice are you going to listen to? Who told you that? And whose voice are you going to listen to? Listen to the whisper of the God who created you and loves you and can transform anything in you. Listen to his voice. Because the other voices are loud. I know your mom's voice, your dad's voice, that told you that you're nothing and you're a mistake, I know that's a loud voice. The voice of your peers, whose opinions mean a lot to you, I know those are loud voices. The voice inside your head that says you're this or you're not that, that can be a loud voice. Listen to the gentle whisper of the God who created you and loves you and can transform anything in you. Listen to his voice. I don't know, kind of like Kyle last week, I don't know how to tell you to respond to this. Some messages set themselves up real well for some action steps. Go do this, this, and this. But the messages in this series don't, don't really set themselves up that way. In these messages, there's just a truth that we have to understand and maybe wrestle with it and pray about it and say, God, what do I need to do with this truth? And, and so this morning, as we continue to worship, I don't know what you need to do with this. But I know we have these altars here where you can come pray about it. And I know Kyle and I and and Pastor Garrett are right here. And if you want to pray with with one of us, you can come pray with us. If you're one of those people who thinks, I've sinned too much to be a Christian, will you please come talk to one of us and stop believing that lie? Whatever you need to do with this right now, whatever you need to pray about this morning, in response to this truth, that God loves you, And he created you, and he can transform anything in you. Just come pray about it. Come talk to us about it as we worship. Would you stand with us?